Greetings, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Today, we get an update on how rising sea due to climate change are causing coastal flooding and how communities along coasts have to prepare. Our guest is Erica sanger Sleepy, and she is the lead climate analyst for the Climate and Energy Program at the Union for Concerned Scientists. She'll discuss one of the most worrisome effects of climate change, how rising seas are impacting coastal communities and what we have to do to prepare. And there is more about her work and Union Concerned Scientists on today's event page, www.scienceforthepublic.org. And now welcome to Erica Sanger Sigby. Hi. Hi, Yvonne, thanks so much. And I'd like to ask you to give us a little background here uh, that this is a problem worldwide. Can you give us uh, some general stuff like in, in terms of the populations, how much of the world's populations live on sea coasts? And it's not just, well, it's cities <laughs> too. Can you give us an idea of that? Certainly. Uh, in the United States, a third of our population lives in, in coastal counties. And uh, globally, there are hundreds of millions of people who live in low-lying coastal areas that are vulnerable to sea level rise. It's certainly a significant issue for the world's population and us here in the United States, for sure. Can you give us a little background about how much of the world lives on sea coasts? And then we'll talk about how quickly this is affecting sea coasts. Certainly. Well, just here in the United States, if we look at coastal counties, it's nearly a third of the U.S. population that lives along our coasts. And globally, we're looking at hundreds of millions of people who live in low-lying areas that are subject to flooding. Uh, today, uh, certainly Bangladesh is a place yeah. that uh, experiences flooding today, but, but in the, the uh, next couple of decades, we're looking at significant risks to millions of people. And really serious things. Back to the United States, we have, I think, a lot of major cities on coast. Is that true? Like New York, Boston, and so on? Absolutely. And so then the issue becomes what happens? How, how do they prepare for this coastal flooding? Um, and then I want to ask also different kinds of flooding. For example, we have this nuisance flooding, and uh, the, the, which I guess is with the title of changes and so on, but that seems to be accelerating actually. So uh, what about that flooding, some of the characteristics? Sure. Well, sea level rise affects us and our communities in three basic different ways. Uh, the one that we learned about early on in the past couple of decades was this idea of permanent inundation, that places would be permanently underwater in the future. And of course, that is a, uh, for most places, that is a distant threat. In the near term, and in fact, in the immediate, when you think about Hurricane Sandy, having uh, higher sea levels allows storms and storm surge to be more damaging and costly and dangerous. But on our way to permanent inundation, uh, just by adding small amounts of sea level to our, our daily high tide, we begin to see areas uh, flood that never flooded before. We begin to see the high tide reach places it could never reach before. And that's what's been happening in the past decade in particular. So places that um, are heavily developed are finding that they're subject to fairly regular sunny day flooding. Yes. Is, is that with high tides, you mean, or say storms that are not hurricanes, but... Yeah, storms are not necessary for this flooding. This is just with, uh, with high tide. Not all high tides are uh, created equal. Some of them uh, over the course of the year are higher than others. And it's particularly those, flood, those tides that are causing uh, the flooding today 
Um, but we can see that in the not too distant future, uh, much more sort of garden variety, everyday high tides will be inundating low lying locations. I see. Can you give us an example of some cities on the, say, the East Coast or the West Coast that are affected? Boston. <laughs> yeah. Boston waterfront. I mean, it's hard to pick a state, basically any state that you pick, I could name a city that is uh, dealing with chronic flooding at this point. Um, the Boston waterfront was, uh, was built as heavily as it was based on the sea level that it was facing, you know, 200, 100 years ago. And now uh, certain tides just reach up onto the waterfront. And, you know, you've probably seen the photos of people uh, down on the wharf in knee deep water on a sunny day. Exactly. And my first thought was like uh, in Miami, for example, I remember people saying, oh, nothing's going to happen for about 100 years down there. And it's happening on a very regular basis. When we talk about these regular kinds of floods, what is the effect on, say, the water sewer system, the roads, all of that kind of equipment for urban life? Sure. Well, I mean, none of our, our uh, land-based infrastructure was built to be flooded on a regular basis. And certainly we're seeing um, roads uh, undermined, roads needing to be um, rebuilt and elevated uh, in order to be able to withstand this kind of regular flooding. Uh, we also are seeing locations like Miami Beach needing to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in pump systems to be able to remove the water from roads and sidewalks and neighborhoods on sunny days and pump it back into the bay. Um, one of the implications there is that not only do you have that, uh, that very disruptive and costly flooding, but you're also pumping water um, that is taking the, the street waste with it back into the bay. This kind of sunny day flooding has lots of costly implications for the communities that deal with it. And it also has implications for, um, for public health and for the natural ecosystems around it. Right, and eventually, of course, it will make living there probably impossible. I'm, I'm just assuming that people will have to really uh, retreat in time. But I understand that this really affects things like the water sewer systems and all sorts of infrastructure issues in those uh, affected areas, and many are. Um, there are other areas, I think that you mentioned this is not one of your areas of expertise, but the Superfund areas where there would be massive contamination. Is that correct? Yes, my colleagues at UCS released a report earlier this week looking at the way that climate change and sea level rise and the, um, you know, the increased reach of storm surge with the kind of storms that we anticipate experiencing um, would flood hundreds of Superfund sites. Exactly. And in addition to that, it's, um, they, they examined uh, and found that it's uh, communities of color, low-income communities that are far more susceptible to this kind of, to the hazards that come with that kind of flooding. And they were already more vulnerable to the environmental effects of all of these things, I guess, too. So here's the thing. Along, say, the East Coast, there were efforts to avoid preparing in many ways by, say, real estate companies that wanted to continue building along coasts. I'm thinking particularly like North Carolina, but there, I think this happened many times. And I've noticed this in the Boston area, why do they continue to build when they certainly know that what the future is going to bring? What's happening there? What's causing that state of denial or whatever? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, one important factor is that the market isn't adequately pricing the risk of sea level rise at the moment. If they were, it, there would be, you know, the, the balance sheets would look a whole lot different when you think about building um, along the, the Boston seaport where, I mean, the, the development there has been astonishing, yes. um, but the, the need to comply, the need to factor sea level rise in and um, build accordingly has been a voluntary approach, yes. um, is my understanding. And, um, you know, until those things change, until the market adequately prices risk, uh, in terms of property value, um, you know, the prospect of resale value and insurance, 
Uh, and until there's there's regulation, uh, much firmer regulation, then we're going to continue to see these things. Right. Now, just speaking of one of those little items like insurance, our people are building presumably business places, all sorts of places, uh, in addition to homes of still on endangered areas of the of the seacoast. But uh, insurance companies aren't really protecting, are they? Well, it's important to note that the um, the insurance system that protects us from coastal flooding is the National Flood Insurance Program, uh, which is funded by you know you and me, the American taxpayer. Um, so it's it's subsidized, and um, you know it's very important that uh, lower income folks living along the coast are able to afford insurance. Uh, it's also true that that program has encouraged rebuilding of uh, properties in, in places that are, you know, too dangerous, too, too costly to continue to, you know, house these, these expensive homes. Well, so it's sending signals that it should not. Right. That, that's exactly one of the issues. As a matter of fact, that, that I see coming up that, that people are allowed to rebuild when in fact they should be retreating and what is driving that, what's causing that, that uh, people can be, I don't know whether they're lied to or <laughs> whether they just don't believe that this is going to continue. What's causing this urge to rebuild instead of retreat? You know, on a very fundamental human level, living along the coast is a little slice of heaven for a lot of people, this right? I mean, it's just, it's just the truth. You know, I grew up in a coastal community and um, uh, there's, uh, you know, they're living by the sea is, is, um, is lovely. Yes. Um, in so many ways. <laughs> uh, it is of course changing and becoming more dangerous. There is, um, there are three basic ways that we uh, are forced to respond to sea level rise as individual homeowners and as communities. And not surprisingly, we're investing heavily in um, the first basket, let's call it, which is uh, defending against the sea. Yeah. So, you know, you see homeowners um, investing in uh, sea walls and barriers to prevent erosion and to uh, you know, basically extend the lifetime of their property and the, the uh, time that they'll be able to spend there. Uh, there's also the, and many communities are investing heavily in defending against the sea and the intrusion of um, tides and, and storm surge. Then we can also accommodate the rising water. And you're seeing actually a lot of homes being elevated, certainly in the wake of Superstorm Sandy, uh, Hurricane Sandy, uh, we saw a lot of rebuilding of uh, homes being in the rebuilding process. We saw many homes being elevated, but you're also seeing new homes uh, that are being constructed, for example, on Cape Cod um, being elevated. And that makes uh, a lot of sense in, in many places. Um, you're seeing waterfront uh, development designs, um, really rethinking in major cities, you know, what the waterfront should look like and how can additional water be accommodated. And then that third basket of retreat uh, is one that you know people naturally don't want to run yeah. to, understandably, right? I mean, we um, we're talking about uh, long-standing neighborhoods in a lot of places, you know, um, communities that uh, will be um, heavily impacted by the loss of these um, of these properties, of these neighborhoods, of um, you know these uh, just sort of ways of life, essentially. But also the property tax base of these communities will be um, significantly undermined uh, with rising seas. So the retreat question is going to be forced, I think. I don't think. The retreat question is going to be forced. Communities' hands and homeowners' hands are going to be forced in the decades ahead. Uh, and the important challenge I think we face is to slowly let some air out of this coastal real estate bubble um, so that retreat can happen in a, you know, a more organized way and uh, in a way that doesn't you know, leave people in financial ruin uh, and leave communities with um, you know, gaping budget deficits and that sort of thing. Right, which they're gonna end up with <laughs> anyway down the, down the line. But in the, in, at the moment you mentioned there that, that people are 
building seawalls and doing this, that, and the other. And this is true for cities as well. How much of that is going on. How effective is that? How long can any of this last? A seawall off New York City or, and these uh, trying to protect marshlands, for example, that sort of thing, when you have an accelerating sea level rise. It's a little different from the occasional storm. So what are some of the effective or, in your mind, the most effective approaches to dealing with it and how long can it last? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it really depends on the location and the kind of sea level rise they're dealing with and what um, they want to defend and protect. When it comes to our major cities, we're likely to, to throw a lot of money at this problem to try and forestall major uh, you know, upheaval and retreat from you know, city waterfronts for as long as possible. Um, you know, that's that's understandable in, in many ways. It's difficult to say when these measures will, uh, when their lifetime will sort of run out. Uh, and there are few in place at the moment that, uh, that protect major cities from storm surge. So Boston, for example, was spared uh, major flooding from Hurricane Sandy because when it rolled through, it happened to be low tide. And um, you know, had that been different, despite the fact that we do have some protections in place, the flooding would have been very significant. And uh, we're, we are building, there are plans to build um, protective measures, but we're, um, you know, it's a major coastal city and we're not going to um, construct uh, 10 foot walls along our waterfront. People don't want that for aesthetic reasons. There were um, discussions about constructing a major harbor barrier. You might be aware of that. Um, that was under consideration, a multi-billion dollar project um, to protect from storm surge. And um, for the time being, that has been shelved because of the a whole range of implications, including uh, ecological ones. Um, so we're, we're working on uh, other approaches to just sort of extending the, um, you know, keeping what we have for as long as we can in these major, relatively well-funded cities. It's going to be in the smaller, uh, the smaller cities and towns um, where they're not necessarily going to have the resources to invest in keeping things uh, in place as they are indefinitely. Um, you know, places that are very low lying and face near term uh, are dealing with chronic flooding now and face near term increases are going to need to think seriously about uh, you know the whole range of measures, including retreating from the most vulnerable areas. Um, there are some examples of this, uh, but it, we can expect in the coming decade to see many more. Right. And uh, you mentioned these low-lying areas, you think immediately of like Louisiana, which is simply fading away as we speak because that, that be trying. But from what you mentioned, it sounds like a lot of this is kind of band-aids and not long-range preparation for something that is inevitable at this point. We can't stop this. So what would be the best plan that would not be a band-aid? a temporary fix, what ultimately will we have to do along mm -hmm. the coast or whatever? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we should have a, a coherent coastal adaptation and resilience building policy um, that is nationwide. You know, these, this problem is so significant yeah. and so costly that it's not something that individual municipalities or even states are going to be capable of dealing with on their own long term. Uh, and we do need, um, we are going to need um, federal policy and resources to make sure that those without the ability to, you know, weather uh, the coming change financially aren't ruined in the process. You know, most people's greatest asset is their home. And if that's what hangs in the balance, then we're going to need to um, find ways to, um, to protect folks as some of the air is let out of this coastal real estate bubble. But in addition, you know, we can't, uh, we can't be uh, working to protect and build resilience along our coast while we let climate change spin out of control. So in addition to working on adaptation on the one hand, um, we really do need to be working on climate mitigation on the other. Otherwise, 
the, the, the space where we face danger and risk is just going to continue to grow, no matter how much we invest in this side. So those two pieces are very important to come together for the security of our coast. A lot of sea level rise is baked in at this point. It's not as though we can shut it off. There's tremendous inertia in that system, but let's think long-term. We right. need to make sure we're looking at- Right, right, right. that is a really good point. So, so you need a national policy and it needs to include addressing climate change in general, not rejecting it from what you say. And how long are we talking about? Now, I realize from also what you said, it's uneven. It's different in Louisiana, maybe, than in Boston at the moment, and so on. So ultimately, we are all affected. But roughly speaking, how long? Because not long ago, so many people were saying, oh, we don't have to worry about this for about 100 years. And that's ridiculous at this point. So how long before we really need a national policy? Oh, I think we need a national policy now. Yesterday, maybe. <laughs> right now. I, I really do. And, um, you know, our, our analysis has looked at chronic flooding okay. uh, nationally. We've yeah. looked at the entire coastline of the lower 48 states, and we've asked when and where will uh, chronic flooding uh, arrive and threaten uh, households, threaten properties and uh, threaten communities and their tax base. And it is much sooner than I think most folks appreciate. We only looked out 15, 20, 30 years. And we're talking about in the lifetime of a home mortgage, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of properties being uh, at risk of this flooding arriving, arriving. And of course, once it does, once you have a property that's flooding on a chronic basis, um, our definition of that, by the way, was 26 times a year or on average every other week. That property is not going to be one that sells, certainly not for what it was initially, um, its initial value. So this, this threat is really upon us. Now, we might not be seeing you know, communities up and down the coast underwater every day, but we ought to be smart enough to, we, we are smart enough to be able to follow the science uh, and recognize that this, this threat will overtake us uh, in the next, you know, the, in the coming years and become something that is, you know, a much more expensive proposition to deal with. Okay, thank you very much for that information. And then I'd like to add that one of the best places for public information is Union of Concerned Scientists. You provide on the on Union of Concerned scientists, your projects, the sorts of things that you take up, but also information for the public. And uh, so we'll put the website, uh, Union Concerned Scientists, on, plug it into this. But I'd like people, if you will, to know what Union Concerned Scientists provides for the public. How can they get information there, if you will? Certainly. Well, we work across a range of issues, uh, certainly climate change and energy, as well as clean transportation, uh, food in the environment, global security. And uh, we are a science-based nonprofit. We just celebrated our 50th anniversary, um, dedicated to bringing the best available science to public policymaking. And we, um, you know, we don't take corporate funding. We don't take government funding. So we're able to provide really independent analysis of the best kinds of policies that we should be implementing. And on our website, we have uh, you know, a range of uh, analyses and studies, including uh, ones that my team has developed looking, as I mentioned, at chronic flooding, but also at extreme heat. And um, we have been uh, certainly an enormously important issue. Um, 18 of the 19 hottest years on record have been since 2001. Uh, the hottest five are the last five, and 2020 is on track to potentially be the hottest yet. Uh, my daughter recently graduated from high school, and she's only known, her cohort has only known record-breaking years of heat. And, uh, you know, this summer we saw uh, several locations above the Arctic Circle hit 100 degrees. You know, we're just shattering records left and right. And extreme heat is deadly, of course. And extreme heat affects, uh, it affects the more vulnerable people in our population so we need that. For, you have a lot of information and 
Uh, they also provide, in addition to information, they provide sort of like how to get in touch with important people like your representatives in Congress and that it can be effective. Get out there and do it, especially in a time like this. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Our organization has been very much focusing on the pandemic and yes. uh, the need for science to be recentered in our re response here. Um, the dangers of sidelining science is something we've been looking at for years, but it's especially dangerous, you know, even First deadly at this time. time. Yes, yes, yes. We hope that will change. We hope that will change. But at, also there was a problem with just getting the public around something like climate change. I don't know why, but I think there is more concern about now. And you mentioned the younger generation is acutely aware of the situation that they're kind of an endangered species. So I hope will change very much. I very much appreciate all the good information you've given us. We'll put some more information, link to the event page today. And I wish you great success in your enormous efforts to educate the public and help us, uh, you know, prepare here for what is inevitable at this point. And so thank you very much, Erica, for joining us today. This was uh, Erica Spanger Siegfried and from the Union of Concerned Scientists. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.